want to thank you for your participation in the Caldwell Area Revival. And uh, it was always just an absolute joy to be around the rest of the church. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for your peace. We thank you for uh, your salvation and your deliverance that is ever-present in our lives. We celebrate that today, Lord, by worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And I pray that everything done from this platform and from these pews will be for the edification of God's people. As we lift you up, as we bless your name and sing praises to you, I pray, Father, that you will find pleasure in your people today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, God's children said, Amen. Amen. Remain standing and let's sing to the Lord. If you'll go to your hymnals or follow us on the screen. We'll begin with page 120, Come Thou Almighty King. Come Thou Almighty King, help us Thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all-glorious, over all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless, and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear. In this glad hour, thou who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, Spirit of power. To the great one in three, eternal praises be, hence evermore, his sovereign majesty, may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Amen. Page 613, as we read together the Word of God, follow with us on the screen. This is entitled, The Return of Christ. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words but of the times and the seasons brethren you have no need that I write unto you For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, 
putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And may the Lord our God bless the reading of his word. Amen? Turn with me to page 56. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name Before the Son of God who came Ruined sinners to reclaim Hallelujah, what a Savior Bearing shame and scoffing rude In my place condemned he stood Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring. Then anew this song we'll sing, hallelujah, what a Savior, amen, amen. Look around, find someone, make yourself friendly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Just power through it. We, we probably just need to just get new speakers. It's time. Ushers would take their places at this time. Let's receive our morning tithes and offerings.
Hmm. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we bring to you our worth, we bring to you our substance and our first fruits. Pray, Father, that you take it and multiply it to the use in this community as we join with the rest of the church in this town to touch this city. We thank you, Father, for the faithfulness of God's people, and I pray that your blessings would always be upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Shirley, if you guys would please come on down. The children, would you please come? And as they're coming, I want to remind them to bring their backpacks next Sunday. We're going to bless you and pray over you. And also, teachers, if you've got backpacks, bring them too. We want to pray and bless you. I want to thank Alice. She just pulls out some songs that I haven't heard in years and years. It Will Be Worth It All. Is that what you just played? Have you ever heard the song, It Will Be Worth It All? When we see Jesus, all troubles will soon be gone when we see Christ. One look on His sweet face, all troubles will erase. So quickly run the race till we see Christ. God bless you. My mom used to sing that, and she just surprises me all the time with her her library of songs. Guys? Good morning. How are you guys this morning? I'm going to show you a picture that the congregation can't see out there. Do you have any idea what that is? Kelly? Body parts. That's exactly right. Body parts. This is the inside body parts. This right here are your lungs. Put your hands on your chest and breathe. If you go to the doctor, sometimes he'll tell you to take a deep breath and then exhale. What you feel going up and down is not so much your heart beating, is your lungs filling with air. Do you know, remember when you were born... Some of you remember from Vacation Bible School. Who's this guy laying here on the floor? Kelly, do you remember it all? This is kind of hard for everybody to see. It does look kind of like Sasquatch, yes. Do you remember how God formed us? How Adam was formed? He was formed from the dirt. That's right. So this is a man formed from the dirt. We had a long Sunday school lesson on it in Vacation Bible School. This was the dirt. Now, how did God make this dirt into your body, into Adam's body? Do you remember it all? 
he breathed his very own breath, the breath of God, into Adam and gave him life. And when he gave him life, he gave him a beautiful body. Do you know that you have a beautiful body? And that body is a beautiful vessel. I have some bottles here. Aren't they pretty? And you're going to each get to take home a pretty bottle with you, whatever color you want. Your body is just like that vase or vessel. You are the body of Christ. You have the very breath of God inside of you. Every time you breathe, every time you fill your lungs open and close, that's the breath of God that gave you life. Isn't that pretty cool? A vessel of God. Does anybody want to pray today? No? All right. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us that God knew you before you were even formed in your mother's womb and that he had a purpose and a plan for you. This bottle, this vessel, this body that you are is just to serve that purpose here on earth. The eternal body that you have, the body you're going to have forever, may not look anything like that, but you're still going to be beautiful because you're a child of God. Mr. Andrew, would you close us? Father, we thank you again for coming together and sharing with these little ones. Father, we ask that you uh, put it in their minds and in their hearts that each breath they take and each beat of their heart belongs to you, Father, and that they draw closer to you in a relationship with you. Father, we thank you so much for creating all that you've done, for doing all All right, adults, would you please stand? Kids, if you would come over here before you get your neat bottles. How cool is that, right? That's really neat. If you stretch your right hand of promise and blessing out to these kids, and let's bless them in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, for your hand and your touch to be on these good, good young people. I pray, Father, that wherever they find themselves, they find themselves blessed and touched by your power. I pray that you would protect them, walk with them, speak with them, and Father, we thank you for their good parents, God, who you have ordained to raise them as mom and dad. So in the name of Jesus, we ask you for all of your promises, all of your goodness and your mercy to be manifested in and on their life. In the name of Jesus Christ, let no weapon formed against them ever prosper. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. I asked uh, Fred this morning, one of my opening greetings to him, I said, um, I said, this world, I said, uh, you think this world's going to make it? And uh, for some reason I thought he'd say, we'll figure out a way. He said, absolutely not. (laughs) And he's right. He's right. With all the crises that are going on in the world and and what we're experiencing, um, or the protest, or the upheaval, the uh, threats to our our very core of our nation. Um, this world isn't going to survive. Um, we are in this world as Christians, and we are remnant people. And um, i got a message coming up soon about this, but we are occupiers. Occupiers don't just mark time. Occupiers have authority, and uh, occupiers call the shots. As Christians, I want to encourage you to assert what you know into this world. Be an answer person. Be a person that brings hope and healing to this lost world. Today's message is in that line. It's entitled, Christian Benefits, The Benefit of Knowing. 2 Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 11 and 12. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet, this is no cause for shame, like what Paul says, because I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul wasn't discouraged. 
Paul was someone who had great confidence in who he was. There is no insecurity in the Apostle Paul, especially in this statement. I'm concerned about America and the world, but I know some things. And you know some things. As Christians, what we know can change the environment that we live in. And as a Christian, especially if you are a mom or dad or a grandparent, you have a responsibility to share and continue what you know. And what you know is what you have experienced. If you want to get my attention, tell me that you don't believe something that I know is true. I mean, try to convince me that lemon pie doesn't taste like lemons. And there are people everywhere that try to to push their thought process on someone else and they have no idea what they're talking about because they haven't experienced what they're talking about. You see, you can't really have an opinion until you have an experience. And I have experienced Christ. How many of you have experienced Christ? Raise your hand. You know a lot. Don't go out there saying, well, you know, I'm just this, I don't know much. You know a whole lot. As pastors, Rhonda and I sometimes take for granted what we know. And we have learned the things we have learned in personal studies and going to conferences and, and, and through our personal experiences. We sometimes make the mistake of withholding what we think is common knowledge to everybody. And, and as we do that, you can be guilty of doing the same thing in your environment where people know you. You see, you might think that people have the same experience you have, and they don't. Jesus, you know, the Bible says, just taste and see that the Lord is good. There's only one way to find out for sure if the Lord is good, and that is to taste Him, to experience Him, to know Him. And you've just told me by raised hands, we know and we have experienced Christ. So don't take that for granted and think that everybody knows everything because they just don't. You'd be surprised at the ignorance out there of people who call themselves Christians and people who, call, who identify with the cross of Christ. The same is true with most Christians. Your lost friends deserve the greatest benefit of your friendship, and that is your Christian knowledge. I want you to see yourself as someone who is appointed by God to share what you know and to share it with confidence because you know whom you have believed and you are also confident that He is going to keep you until that day. One of the really sad things about ignorance is that it, 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 it stops you from being who you really should be. And when you choose to be ignorant of what God has said and what is written in His Word, it makes you less effective during your time and in your lifetime, in your lifespan. It's very short, and we have to maximize that. So we need to share what we know. So, what do we know? What exactly do we know? Now, I can't cover that today. I mean, you know a whole lot. You really do. So I can't cover everything, but I want to cover some of the basic things. Today I saw something that uh, a leading pastor in the country was talking about the events in Charlottesville. And he was talking about how that, that in Charlottesville there's a lot of things that, that happened there. And, and, you know, he was telling the church that racism is wrong. And I'm thinking, okay, well, we know that. And, and he, what he's saying is good and right. And he was talking about the white supremacists, and he said, this is straight from the pits of hell. He's absolutely true. That is exactly right. Of course, there were a lot of different people out there, and it's all wrong. When I hear about you know, that these, these people, everybody in Charlottesville, except the cops that were there, you know, they were wrong. They were in that area where, where that, that stuff happened. So there's a lot that it's wrong in the world, and we, we all know that racism is bad. And even in its smallest forms, it's bad. I want to challenge you today to try your best to eradicate those thoughts out of your mind. Because 
what comes to my mind when I think of racism and racial prejudice is that God indeed has created us all. That Jesus doesn't look like them, and He just doesn't, doesn't look like you. He doesn't look like the Asians. He doesn't look like the... You know, He, he was an olive-skinned man. You, you come in here, if we had a, a picture of Jesus, and we do, he, you, you'd say, okay, well, you have an image of Jesus. Then, then that sort of looks like a white man kneeling down at, at, a, at a rock. And then I went over to Seven Star, I believe it's a Missionary Baptist Church, way out in the country recently. I, uh, that was one of the pictures that I took. And I, when I was peeking into the windows, I saw a black Jesus being baptized by a black John the Baptist. It was fascinating. I thought, okay, well, they're, they're identifying that they think he looks like them and we think he looks like us. And, and I haven't seen an Asian Jesus, but I don't know. They may do the same thing. We need to get past stuff like that. And we need to see Jesus as to who He really is, and that is the lover of our souls. All of our souls. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Remember that song? Jesus loves the little children of the world. He loves all the people of the world. He died for all the people of the world. So when you speak against someone of different color or race or culture, then you're in, on very dangerous grounds because you're speaking against God's image. You're speaking of against who He died for. So, as Christians, we need to know that. We, don't, we shouldn't have to be told that from a pulpit. It should be common knowledge. We should be above and beyond that. Amen? I mean, what is the church doing with that message? Going, oh, really? <laughs> so, is theft wrong too? You know? Is, is adultery still wrong? I don't know. I'm not sure. Come on, friend. We need to know what sin is. One of, the, one of the things about knowing is we know what right and wrong is. I had young people in my youth group would come up and they'd ask me questions when I was youth pastor, and especially, especially in Colleen. Brother Dave, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is this wrong? I looked at him. I said, well, what do you think? Well, is it wrong? I said, that, that's, <laughs> I'm asking you a question. What do you think? How do you feel? Well, you know, I... I it, it sort of doesn't feel right. It sort of doesn't feel right. See, what he's wanting me to do is to say, no, nah, it's okay. You know, We are Christians. We have the Spirit of Christ in us, and we know what right and wrong is. Amen? We can rightly discern what right and wrong is, even when people challenge us and say, that's not wrong, that's not so wrong. As a child of God who is intimate with God's nature, I know who He is. I know what He thinks. I know his, his nature and His character. I'm intimate with Him because I'm in relationship with Him. I know what He's going to say. When you were a kid and your mom said, you asked your mom something, she said, go ask Dad. <sighs> mom, why were you disappointed? Because you know Dad, amen? You knew what He was going to say. You didn't go say, Dad, do what? What did you say? Go ask, <laughs> go ask Mom again, that's right. Mom, I've asked that. I'm coming to appeal you again. Begin to work that thing. Again, it's not a negotiation. But when you, when you were told to go ask Mom or go to ask Dad, you already knew what the answer was because you knew them. Well, God is our Heavenly Father. And we're supposed to know Him. And we're supposed to be able to discern between our left and our right hand, right and wrong, white and darkness. Light and darkness, I'm sorry. So we know the difference because we know God. It's important that you tell people what the difference is. It's important that you share what you know about things. Don't be shy or embarrassed or timid when it comes to things of God because people need to hear this. And if they're not going to hear it from the church, where are they going to hear it? We need to speak up because you have the benefit of knowing. And if you have unsaved or you have lost friends, they have a benefit in you. That's why you should develop friendships. Now, I'm not talking about running buddies where you go and do things like they're doing. But I'm saying for you to have a friendship with someone who's lost. They would highly value your friendship because you know things they don't know. You've tasted things they haven't tasted. You've experienced things that they've only heard about. It's interesting. I am so many people's tongue-talking friend. <laughs> now, let me tell you what I mean by that. 
they've heard about people who speak in tongues. They've seen stuff. But I've got a friend who does. It's like I'm a commodity now, you know. Yeah, he's my, he's my Pentecostal friend, you know. So they, they sort of like knowing somebody who has experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the evidence of speaking in tongues. I want you to be someone's Christian friend. Someone that believes in Jesus. Someone who has experienced Christ. Someone who knows Him intimately. And you can be a benefit to wherever God has put you. See yourself as a benefit. And with that, sometimes, comes some sacrifice. Because you can't do things the way everybody else does them. You can't say things that everybody else is saying. Because you live to a high standard. And that is the high standard of the cross. But you're a benefit to people. See yourself as that. We, 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 we've learned so much to just consume and consume and consume. What's in it for me? What do I get from church? What, blah, 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 blah. It's time to give. It's time to share. It's time to be a light in this world. Not just someone that, that gets dim every... By, by, by Tuesday, we're dim. We need to get back up next to the bulb, get bright again. Then we can get dim again on Wednesday. We can come back and get bright again. We need to shine the love and the relationship of Jesus Christ that is in us. Amen? All right. So what do we know? Number one, we know that without Jesus, there is no hope. Period. Without Jesus, there is nothing else. He is all in all. He is everything. I've had people say, are you, are you telling me? It's interesting because we went to this Sunday school and a lot of the same scriptures that you, you, we heard today, you're going you're to hear this. But... When people say, are you telling me that Jesus is, is it? He's the only way? And what they're doing is they're setting you up to be a religious bigot is what they're doing. And I'll, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Be willing to let that happen. See, absolutely. Jesus is the only hope for mankind. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There is no one else beside Him. Without Jesus, there is no hope. John chapter 14, verses 6 through 9. Jesus answered, and listen, he's very specific and very clear about this. This isn't up for interpretation. It's very in your face. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, interesting, huh? God wants you to know him. He knows you. He's always known you. But to complete that relationship, he wants you to know Him. He said, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know Him and have seen Him. Well, this is bold. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time. Let that sink in. Are you heard what's coming? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Friend, we need to understand exactly who He is. Exactly what He has done. And exactly what that means in our lives. There is no other way that you can be saved except through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Jesus Again, we go back to Sunday school. Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected. You didn't know who you were dealing with. Do you know who you're dealing with? He says, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Not, not no other name given to the United States or Texas, or Georgia, or Alabama, or Michigan. No, no. Unto mankind. He is it, zip, not others, no one else. It's just Him. And you know that. You have that answer. And people need that. They need it decisively. They need it confidently. They need to know that, that you know where you're going and who you are. Back when I was a kid, before there was GPS, there was the Philip 66 station. The Gulf stations. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> and when you needed directions, you'd pull into a gas station. Ding, ding. I remember hearing that. that dad, dad, dad would say, 
yeah, um, could you tell me how to get on the viaduct bypass, blah, 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 blah. And this guy pull out his oil rag and start, you know, well, what you need to do here is, and then he'd start talking, and, and I'd think, wow, what an archaic way to get directions. Who is this guy? I think, Dad, do you know him? No. Mom, do you know him? No. Nobody knows him. But yet, here we're going to go in the direction that this guy pointed it. And we had about a, I would say, a 57% success rate in doing that. Thank goodness for GPS. Amen? I think, I think, uh, Bobby, Bobby, come over here right quick. Uh, he's wanting to get to the, uh, what was that you said, sir? I mean, it was harem scarum. And here we go trusting and confiding in what we just heard because we just didn't know anything else. Don't be that guy at the service station. When someone asks you about God, Christ, what's going on in the world, and who, who we really are supposed to be, don't hesitate. Don't pull that old rag and go, well, let me see here. I'm going to tell you what we got now. You need to know your stuff. You need to be confident. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And I, I, I'm confident that He is able... So if you are listening to Paul, he's not wondering, he's not guessing, he knows exactly what he's talking about because he is in relationship with Jesus Christ. And your relationship with Jesus is a benefit to your lost friends and relatives. Someone say amen now. Come on now. I'm, I'm telling you the truth here. I want to encourage you to be that light and be that confident person that your friends are counting on you being. Because things are about to get worse than they are. And when they start asking you questions, send them to me, I'll, I'll answer, but you, don't, you really shouldn't have to do that. Because you know who I know. You know what I know. And you have experienced who I have experienced. The way that people live tells us, and I'm talking about some people who claim Christianity, it tells us they either don't believe this, or they don't know God. Your job, your responsibility is to tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. My, my good friends in town, it's funny because some, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one that ever asked this question, but when I, when I give a charge or I give an encouragement to my, my pastor friends or I see them on a Sunday afternoon at a restaurant or something, I walk up and say, Hey, Rick, did you tell them the truth today? Yes, I did. David, I sure did. David, go tell them the truth tomorrow. I will, man. That's me. That is our calling, is to tell people the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I'm the life. And I am a benefit to people that I'm around because I know the truth. I have experienced Him. I've had people say, well, they, they, they log give logic and reasoning and romanticism and all this stuff. And blah, 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 blah. I said, well, I understand what you're saying and, and I understand, but I have experienced this. Now you're faced with something in my, my, you're in my conversation. You're going to look at me and say, well, <clears throat> he's delusion, <coughs> he's hypnotized, or he's just whatever. But you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to say, David's trustworthy, I know this guy, he's not a nutcase. Maybe there's something to what he's saying. Or you're going to say he's just lost his mind. But that is their thing to deal with. What my job is to do is to tell them the truth. And I want to encourage you, because you know, God, that is what you do. Number two, what do we know? We know that God loves us. <clears throat> we know that God cares for us. And we know that God knows us. This is not common knowledge. Do not take this statement for granted. Think, well, everybody knows that. No, they don't. No, they don't. When they say God loves them, what, they're, what a lot of people are doing is they're trying to make excuse for their sinful lifestyles. But they don't realize just how much God loves them. Randy, if you could put that thing up that I, that I found... I was on Facebook the other day, and I was just stunned. I, I'm thrilled to, to see this. I'm so excited. It says, your memories on Facebook. David, they know me, right? We care about you and the memories you share here. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Facebook cares. 
I'll tell you, friends. A lot of people say they care. A lot of people don't know who you are, never seen you, never experienced your, your friendship. But God really, really does care for you. And this is what separates us from all other religions. My friend who is an atheist, I told him. He said, well, are you saying that it's just you? I said, well, there's something that distinguishes us from all other religions. And I talked with him about Satan and how that Satan would put a veritable Vegas buffet out there for everyone to choose from because he doesn't want you to choose the, the way, the truth, and the life. But in, in talking with him, I said, Jesus cares for us as individuals. These other religions don't have gods who care for you, much less know your name. You're a number. You're, you're just something, inanimate objects on the earth. But only God, only the Lord our God through Jesus Christ his Savior and His wonderful Holy Spirit knows you by name. And He indeed, He really does care for you. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Let's go through some scriptures. Cast all your anxiety or your cares on Him because He cares for you. You'll never bore God with your problems. You'll never bore God with your problems. His ear is inclined to you, the Bible tells us, because He does care. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. I don't know if I've ever lavished. Well, I've let my, I lavish my wife. That's, that's something I can identify, but just about any other thing in life, I don't know that I lavish anything. But God has lavished His love on us that we should be called children of God. I guess, you know, experiencing this new grandparent phenomenon, we have this thing at, with Seth and Casey. Uh, you know, Casey works at a hospital. Seth works, you know, at the crane company. And that leaves, you know, in not being with a grandparent around, she has to go to a daycare. And it just, it just breaks my heart, you know, but it's, it's, it's just life. But we have an, an option. I have two things on my phone, two apps, that if I want to see little Anna Lee Rose any time of the day, there's what, uh, five cameras in that daycare center? And we can, I, can, I can sit there and watch Annalie play. What's funny is that I'll be watching Annalie play and all of a sudden my screen will go blank. That means Rhonda has gotten on there and knocked me off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know when, I know when her diapers change. We know it we know, had, had banana and, and goldfish. We know what she's eaten. We know when she goes to sleep. We know when she wakes up. I mean, and then, then if we don't just see that, then we can watch her. So, yeah, we're lavishing. And I, I'll look at those pictures and I'll go, look at her. She's amazing. You know, so that is, I'm lavishing on this sweet little, sweet little girl. God makes me look like an amateur. Now listen to me. God loves you and lavishes on you more than you ever will a grandchild or great-grandchild or child. I'm going to tell you something, friend. He has lavished His love on us. And He calls us His children. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. They don't understand us because they don't know who He is. And then King James Version, Isaiah, chapter 43, and verse 1. But, but now, thus saith the Lord, that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by name. Thou art mine. So when you say, Lord, this is David, he knows that already. Amen? All you have to do is say, Lord, here I am, Lord. He knows you. It's like Anne Lee coming to us, you know, on a visit. And she's at that age where every time she sees us almost, well, me, <laughs> She's really warmed up to Rhonda, but I'm, I'm still, you know, struggling, you know, to, 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 to gain her affection. I'm still this big stranger, you know. But, but, but I don't, she doesn't have to say, hi, uh, Poppy, I, I am Anna Lee Rose Johnson. And that's my, my dad, his name is uh, Seth, and this is Casey. I know that. And your God knows you. He knows your name. And I know that. He loves us. And He wants to be a part of our lives. Now, 
I'm going to do something. I'm really taking a risk here. And I'm just hoping that this is really from God because I really had a trouble, problem doing this. But I found some images. And I don't want you to be offended. Miranda, would you put that first image up right, right quick? Now, this is Jerry Jones. Hold on. Hold on. Don't get mad at me. <clears throat> He's the owner of the Dallas Cowboys. And toward the end of games, he often will come down on the field. Have you ever seen that, right? Okay, I'm alone here. They're not admitting it at all. So he'll come down the field because that's his team. He pays the salary of everybody, including the water boys. Everything. He pays, makes the payments on the stadium. He handles the insurance. He has a lot invested. If you can go to the, show, show these other images. So he wants to be a part. Although he's not the coach there, he's pretending to give Tony Romo some advice. You know, But this guy has more invested than anybody else in that organization. Go to the next one. This is his field. This is everything. And I notice when he's come out on that field sometimes, the players sort of look at him, they sort of, you know, walk away. You know, it's what people do to the owner a lot. Now, I'm not comparing him to God, but the relationship is similar in that he has, he's probably the biggest cowboy fan in the world. And he's the most criticized cowboy fan. Is that all I had was three? Oh, I had another one. I, can you figure that? But here he is trying to enjoy his investment. He's really excited that he owns this team and that he wants them to win. Now, our God is not distant. Our God is not supposed to be an acquaintance of ours. He is not supposed to be the, 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 the good man upstairs. Let me tell you something. That in everything that I know about God, God doesn't want you to call him the good man upstairs. Or what is it, the man upstairs? What's some other phrases that I, I just... I, to me, it's like a tell. When people, the, the good Lord, the good Lord, do you, do you call your sweet darling the good wife? You know? Or, or the old man or the old lady? Come on, guys. You need, you need to up your game if that's, if that's your case. God doesn't want to be spoken of in those terms. He lavishes His love upon you. He's invested His very life into you. Gave His life came down and took on the form of fallen man and suffered and died for your sins. For you to call Him the good Lord? Now, there's sometimes when you're upset, you say, good Lord. You know? I mean, good grief freaks. What freaks? People? Huh? You're not freaks. <laughs> good, good, good grief, people. We need to understand that He isn't that way. That's not our relationship with Him. That's not who He is to us. He's an intimate Father that loves us and is not distant He's not an acquaintance. He really, really does care for us. God created us for companionship. I mean, that's who we are. We are God's companions. We are His fellowship. He, is, he has created us so that He could love on us, so that He could embrace us, so He could pull us close to Him. Finally, number three, God has a plan for you as an individual. As an individual. Not as a culture, not as a country or state, not as a city or county or region. An individual. Remember, God knows you. We want you to get on the team. But you also need to be a free agent that God is speaking to personally. I had a preacher friend challenge me one time. He said, what's God telling you right now? Uh, What? What's God telling you right now? Man, that challenged me years ago. What is God telling me? What does God want me to do? And why am I not hearing Him tell me anything? And I had to double down and, and increase my relationship with Him and incline my ear to Him and what He was saying. You see, God has a plan. And you're not going to know that unless you know God. Jeremiah 29 and 11. Shirley mentioned this the children. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Now that's Jeremiah 1, five. Do you have 29.11? He says, I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans to prosper you and to give you a future. God knows you and God has specific plans for you as an individual. And as he told Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, he said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. That means you're holy. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So God has a plan. 
But most people, you know, they don't know this. They don't realize this. You see, they bought the, the bill of goods from the world <clears throat> that our God's like every other religion. It's a religion of acquaintance. It's a religion of, of, of not intimacy, but distance. But God knows you. And God has a plan for you. And God wants to speak to you. One of the things I love about our country, we are not a collective country. We're not socialists. We're not communists. No. We believe in individual liberties that are granted by our sovereign God with certain unalienable rights God has given us. One of the beautiful things about the United States of America and our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, it speaks to individualism. It speaks the same way that God is speaking to you as an individual. That we are free to pursue liberty and justice and happiness. God loves you. He wants you to succeed, but He also wants a relationship with you. And He wants you to know how much He cares for you and how much He has planned for you. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. How then can we call on the one they have not believed in. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Christian friends, that's your responsibility. And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? Do you hear God? What is He saying to you? What is His individual plan in your life? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. We need to get that. We need to understand this. You are a benefit to the people God has put in your life. You are. Stop looking down on yourself and saying, well, I don't know anything. I'm just an average person. No, no. You're much, 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 much more than that. As much as racism is from the pits of hell. That thought process is also from the pits of hell too. Because it will stop you from finding out what God has for you. It will keep you from an intimate relationship with the Lord our God who loves you, cares for you, and knows you. I want to encourage you this morning. Because we know, we must go and tell. I want you to be a benefit not just to your, in your immediate family, but to all those that know you, to all those that God has allowed in your life. I want you to see them as assignments. Tell them the truth. And don't worry about anything. Just tell them the truth. Someone told you the truth. You owe it to give it back. To just tell someone that God loves them, that He cares for them. If you're more worried about what they're going to think about you, shame on you. That is so selfish. We need to be willing to lay down our lives. We need to be willing to abase ourselves. If they don't like us, that's fine. As long as you like God, as long as you love your Creator, I'm going to be a conduit of His good news. And you know what God turns around and says? Man, how beautiful are the feet of those who tell people the truth. And the truth isn't always bad news. If you're the kind of person that says, I'm going to tell them the truth. I'm going to tell them how bad they are. Listen, friend, the world will tell them how bad they are. We need to tell them the good news that God loves them and has a plan for their life. Stand with me, please, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've heard your message. We've heard your word. And Lord, we pledge to you to demonstrate our obedience We know You because You first knew us. And to know You is to love You. And Father, I love You. You are everything to me. You are my life. You have taken this imperfect man and You have placed Your message in him. And whether I preach it from a pulpit or whether I speak it at a restaurant or at a gas station, wherever I am, I pray, God, that You would let me be a loud, loud voice mouthpiece for your goodness and your greatness. And I pray, Father, that I will bring healing 
to the friendships that I have. I'll bring hope to a world that is collapsing before our very eyes because I know the truth and the truth has set me free. And if you've set me free, you can set others too, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this challenge. And Father, we accept in Jesus' name. All of God's children said, Amen and Amen. Raise your right hands. Let's speak this by faith. You ready? Speak with me. Lord, I want my feet to be beautiful. I will tell what I've been told. I will share and not withhold. There is hope for the world. You know me. You love me. And you care for me. You have a plan for my friends' lives also. What I know, I will share with my friends that you love. Here I am, Lord. Send me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Remain standing with me. Let's go to our hymn, then I'll read a scripture to you at the end. This hymn is a song we sang together at the revival. Bind us together, Lord. You can follow with us on the screen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. This is the truth. There is only one God. There is only one King. There is only one body. That is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. I leave this with you. And He told them, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. I feel confident this morning that you have the good news and that you know the Lord and you're going to do your part. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Go with God in the power of His might. Make a difference. Shine. Be flavor. Let's make a difference. We've got a shot this week. Let's make the most of it. Amen? God bless you. You may be seated and dismissed. Yes, yes. Offering. Oh, yes. It ushers. Would you please come? Thank you, Brother Fred, was getting up to remind me. We're going to do something really special this morning. We're going to receive an offering for Tristan. Tristan is going to Costa Rica to do exactly what we've been talking about today, share the gospel and be the light to the people down there. And we're going to give you an opportunity to, to be a part of it. Now, if you can't, that's okay. Do as God has blessed you. And uh, the Lord will, will definitely bless you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, be with Tristan. Keep him safe. Give him a clear, clear voice, God. And Lord, in that moment, when he is called upon to evangelize, when he is called upon to tell what he knows, I pray that his words will be clear, his confidence will be strong, and Lord, you will touch him with your power and your Holy Spirit as he speaks. In Jesus' name, God's children said... Amen. Give us unto the Lord, and when we're finished, you may be dismissed.